Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time you're actually watching this presentation. Uh, and obviously, I hope you're all safe and well. Please let me introduce myself. My name is Carl Feist Thompson. And also, may I just add, I'm completely honoured once again to be asked to talk on this employability conference. So the question is why? Why have they asked this large gentleman from Kerno to talk on this employability conference? Well, I can only think of one thing, um, my diverse and indirect route to the job that I'm in now. I never followed a specific route and I never followed the norm route. I've had an extensive journey, a very colorful journey, and a very experiential journey to get to the job I'm in right now. And I have been in the same job now, and I hate calling it a job because I love it so much for around nine years. But I don't want to give away my job just yet because I don't want to spoil the kind of the story to the kind of end point, which is still not ended yet. Who knows? Now, what I must do, and please, this is not some sort of way of me grasping the audience and trying to get you to feel sorry for me and win my audience over and get you to play violence for me. What I must do though is explain my journey in education, my, my learning journey, my educational journey, my academic journey. It will make sense in regards to the choices I possibly made through my employability journey. So without further ado, let's stop waffling and I'll get on with it. So age five, I did attend school, a tiny little school in Plymouth called Knoll Primary. And then due to a family kind of split, I was taken by my mum and her boyfriend. My five siblings stayed with my father. Now you need to know that because I was taken by my mum and we lived almost like a, a traveling lifestyle. Tents, caravans, sofa sleeping. I kind of disappeared into the ether so my other family couldn't find me. So I left education only two years. Now this is the big point. I re-emerged in education due to social services finding me and they placed us, the family unit, in a small caravan in an amazing little campsite called Shalabra. And it had a massive impact on me, this area. And looking back now, I kind of realize where my enthusiasm for certain things lie and my drive and my passions lie because of this experience that I had between seven and eight, just one year in my life, but just amazing. So this little kind of seasidey village, Shalabra, in Devon, um, I remember getting up to go to the school and I'd put my little uniform on and I'd walk all the way to this place called Ringmore, where it's about a mile walk, I'd get on the coach and off I'd go to this little school called Mobbury Primary School. Brilliant little school. That wasn't the big thing for me though, it was when I came home. I, I it was okay in school, I liked learning, but when I got home, I was able to get changed quickly, run down for the campsite and go and see two of my best mates, Tom and Dave. And Tom and Dave, at that time, were the lifeguards. I must have been so annoying. This little shrimp running into their lifeguard, uh, hi Tom, hi Dave. Oh, I wanted to be a lifeguard, that's what I wanted. And they took me under their wing, they let me use their surfboards, they taught me surfing, they taught me how to use paddle boards, they taught me got a first aid, and I just hung out with them, and it was so cool. Watched them do rescues, not many, because it was Shalabra, and it's not really a dangerous peach, but they had a huge impact on me, and I think I learned a lot from them, because they were so kind and gentle with people as well, the way they spoke. Love to meet them now, don't know where they are. Anyway, then unfortunately, uh, we left that, and we went through lots of, I went through lots of different schools. So long story short, you're going to hear me say that quite a few times. My education journey, I went through 12 different schools. Three of those were secondaries or comprehensives. The second place that had a huge impact on me and my education and my academic journey was Dartmouth. Now, because we'd moved and we were put into different placements in different houses within different council estates, we ended up in Torbay and we ended up in Dartmouth. Now, and a lovely estate called Yo Park, which is the top of Dartmouth by the Royal Naval College. And I started going to Dartmouth Community College. Went to the primary school first last year, which was really difficult. And I struggled and I, I was really behind, especially with writing and reading. Maths was okay. I love looking at the patterns and recognizing patterns in maths. Love science, had an absolute affinity with natural history. My hero was David Attenborough. 
I would just ugh, and and marine biology, anything to do with marine biology, especially sharks, any any sort of fish. But then I kind of stepped into Dartmouth Community College. I was way behind, however, had some massively impacted teachers that had huge effects on me. Great science teachers, Mr. Stocker, uh, Mr. Cro Crocker and Stokes, sorry, um, and Mr. Vosper. Oh, brilliant teacher, um, my PE teacher there. But still, I didn't really get on in school. I knew I was way behind. I knew I was lagging. And I, I put it down to not being in education for a long time and constantly moving to different education kind of zones and areas and just being lost in the system. Anyway, what I did start doing at a very early age in Dartmouth was working and earning some decent money aged 13 and 14. Saturday and Sunday job, driving the yacht taxi, it was called the Puffin, and I'd get in this little boat and the skipper taught me how to drive, and I would go from Dartmouth over to Kingswear, we'd pick up all the yachty people, they'd come on the boat and we'd take them over to Dartmouth to their restaurants, all the restaurants and shops, and we'd get tips and all sorts of crazy stuff. And I thought, this is great. I'm working, you know, I'm getting money, and I'm only 13, nearly 14. I wanted more. Unfortunately at the time as well, I was having to pay my parents at the time money for food and living in their house, even though it was a council house, they still wanted me to pay rent. So I got other jobs. So as well as doing the yacht taxi, I got a job washing dishes at a lovely little restaurant called the Station Calf. It was right on the front. So as I'm washing dishes, I could look out on the river and watch all the yachts going up and down. And I also got another job as a waiter in a lovely little restaurant in Dartmouth called the Pizza Casa. It was like a pizza stroke bistro past the restaurant. Um, I've loved it so much being a waiter there that they actually made me the head waiter. I was one of the youngest head waiters they've ever had. In fact, any of the restaurants ever had and I loved it. I was really polite. Good afternoon, sir. May I take your order? Hello, madam. What would you like? Have you seen the menu? I loved it. I got big tips and I was earning a lot of money, but to the detriment of my schooling, I hardly went to school, but I loved interacting with other people, working hard, showing people what I could do, giving them a service of a high quality and, you know, getting paid for it. I was happy. Then we moved again. We left Dartmouth and we had to move back to Plymouth and unfortunately it was a, a quite a deprived area and the school I went to was nowhere near on par as the school I was at in Dartmouth. In fact, it was so bad it had to change its name whilst I was there because the Ofsted was so bad and it got a really bad name. Anyway, long story short, we moved again in Plymouth area, just to another area, another different secondary school that I hardly went to at all. In fact, I decided, age 15, turning 16 nearly, school's not for me. And I, I didn't even do my GCSEs. What I wanted to do was just work and earn money, which unfortunately, growing up in my family unit that I had grown up in, they never did. Um, I just wanted to, it was my choice. I always wanted more and wanted better for myself. So, I decided I'm leaving school and I'm also gonna move out. I wanted to live on my own. I wanted to be, I wanted to be independent now. The money that I earned, instead of giving it to my family unit, my mum, my, my, my stepdad at the time, I decided that I wanted to have that money to myself. So, uh, I decided to kind of rekindle my relationship with my estranged elder brother, Chris, who was at the time working as a trawlerman on the trawlers at the Barbican. I'm nearly 16, so off I went to the Barbican, met up with him, kind of got on, and he introduced me to a skipper. All I could do on the boat, because I was so young, was deck hands, so it was all the menial jobs, all the horrible jobs that you don't want to do. But one of the jobs, funny enough, I did like doing was fish packing, it was the ice packing. They leave me alone down in the hold, and when the fish had been gutted and sorted, they'd send them down the conveyor belt, and I would pack the inside of the fish with lots of ice, lay them into all these crates, and then stack the crates, and that was my job. And as a 16 year old, it was pretty good money. In fact, it was so good, I was able to save up, because I was, I was kind of, you know, sleeping on sofas at friends' house, and in and out of kind of other families' houses at the time. I was able to save up and put a deposit on my first flat. It was amazing. Didn't buy it, it was just rented in Union Street. So there I am working as this 
you know, crazy fisherman now. And I thought that was it. Maybe this is going to be it for me. Is this going to be all I do? However, I knew it wasn't for me. I knew there was something else. And, you know, I was just fed up with smelling a fish all the time. And just the hours were crazy as well. And I remember walking back to the barbecue and I'm walking up through uh, Plymouth City Centre back towards my flat in Union Street and walking past this big building site. It said Car Keek building site and they were after it said, you know, um, wanted, labourers wanted, and I thought I could do that. And right underneath it, very importantly, it said, no experience needed. I have no experience, but I know I can work. And building trade, it was good money. So I remember going in and knocking on the porter cabin door, and this gentleman came out, and I said, excuse me, sir, may I ask, um, is there any work going? He said, well, we are after labourers. Um, I said, I've got no experience. He said, well, let me introduce you to the foreman. Former came out, a gentleman called Mike, large gentleman, big white beard, looked like Father Christmas with a hard hat on. And he said, hello, young man, how can I help? And I said, oh, I'm after some work. And he said, well, unfortunately, even though it says not experience, I do want some experience. And I think you might be a bit young, my friend. I then instantly in my head thought I could do this and I want to show him that I can do this. So this is what I said, sir. Before I go, before you go, can I just put up a proposal to you? What if I came and worked with you for a whole week, one week, and cleaned this entire site and showed you how hard I could work? If I'm rubbish, you've got a week's worth of work out of someone that you don't have to pay for. If I'm any good, offer me a job. And he started laughing and he went, do you know what? No one's ever said that to me before. No one's ever come and proposed a job like that before, so you can come in tomorrow. So I did, and then I went, and my first job was to clean the site. And you know, I did four days. After four days, of, I worked so hard. I turned up really early, as early as I could, finished as late as I possibly could, and I kept that site clean. I worked hard. Four days later, he called me into the office. He said, Carl, stop. He said, I'm gonna take you on. And I was like, brilliant. So here we go again, long story short, I stayed there for quite a few months until the building had kind of come to its end, it was finished. Now actually he wanted to keep me on and he wanted to go to Birmingham. I didn't want to go anywhere near a big city because of my love of one thing. Remember I told you back at Shalabra, age seven, I was taught surfing, I had this love of the ocean, love of lifeguarding and this beach lifestyle. I needed to stay by the coast. You see, all these other jobs I was doing really was just to feed me to be able to get a flat, somewhere to live, and be able to survive for the weekends, because weekends I would just disappear. In my friend's van, or I'd get the train or a, or a bus with my surfboard, and I was down to Newquay. Especially on a Friday night, we'd end up in the Balji, the grunge night, have a fantastic night, and then phew, for a surf, if it was any surf, back to work, back to Plymouth on the Monday, you know? So that's why I kind of all I wanted to do was work, earn money, look after myself, but be able to do this thing I loved. When it came to its end, I had to start looking for something, another job, uh, a new job, because I don't know what I was going to do. It was coming to its end, I don't want to go to Birmingham. So I remember getting the Plymouth uh, Herald, the Evening Herald, and I'm sat in my little flat in Union Street, and there it is on the page. It said, Kennel Hands Wanted, Plymouth Cats and Dogs Home, Cat Down. No experience needed. That's me again. It's me again. Off I went really early. I remember going really early. I waited there until the person I was there, six o'clock dead on. Person arrived at half six. It was a young lady. She was the manager. And I said, oh, good morning. I hope you don't mind. I'm here to uh, inquire about the job. She said, well, come in. It's freezing because it was getting towards winter. She went, come in, come in, come in. I remember going in and sat there and I talked about what I've been doing and why I've been doing it. And I even said the same thing to her. I said, look, you know, I'm willing to work for free to show you what I can do. And I'm a really fast learner. All I need is opportunity. I took, I took the ball literally by the horns. I don't like uh, sayings, but I will say, I literally went, no, come on, please. And she went, do you know what? We're going to give me a go. <laughs> so I did. Great job. There were some downsides and some really downsides. And then there was an amazing side to it. So what was the job? So each morning you'd walk in to the most horrendous, horrific smell your nostrils would ever come in contact to. 
Imagine 250 dogs have just urinated and defecated everywhere in their indoor kennel. You would first of all quickly open up all the external gates to get them out of the outdoor kennels. And then you would go with a bucket and a little shovel, picking up all the poo, oops, sorry, fecal matter, sorry. And then you'd put it in the world's biggest toilet, it was huge. <laughs> Give it a stir, flush it, keep doing that until all the fecal matter was clear. And then you would hose all the kennels, completely scrub them, make sure they're all clean, clean all the bedding, redo all the food, give the right medication to the right uh, little, little, little deer ones. Then of course you'd look at grooming and then washing, which I love, I thought it was hilarious, giving loads of dogs bath, it was brilliant, and they'd give you loads of cuddles and licks, I loved it because I loved animals. And the best bit, when all that's done, you get to go in the yard and just play. And it'd be like 10, 20 dogs, and you just play with them, and it was amazing. I actually thought I was a dog at one point. Downsides. Obviously the smell, and picking up poo all the time. Sorry, fecal matter, I do apologise, very rude. Watching the dogs being put down, I couldn't do it. Uh, the first couple of weeks, we had to experience it, but then I said, I can't do this anymore. And turning up on Christmas Day, uh, I remember I was there for nearly, nearly a you know, good few months. I started early, win you know, that just early start of the winter. And then when Christmas started, I remember turning up early in the morning, the day after Christmas Day, and there was three dogs tied to the, the railings, just left there all night. One of them was a puppy. I can't do this, what's wrong with people? Why would you do that? So it was time for me to move on. But what to do next, what to do next, I wasn't sure. Now I was still working at the Cats and Dogs and when I was walking through, it was, it was a weekend, I was walking through Plymouth City Centre and I just walked through Marks and Spencers only to take a shortcut. I couldn't afford to shop in Marks and Spencers. So I took a shortcut and turned the corner. There was this shop there and it said John Douglas. And had loads of these Paul Mitchell hair products all lined up. It looked really white and pristine. But right in the middle of the, the window it said, uh, Weekend staff required. Apply within. No experience needed. It's me again. I've got no experience. In I go. And I remember going up these stairs. And I met a husband and wife team. And they owned the salon. And I spoke to them again. I told them my journey so far. And they said, well... What, what, what do, you, do you understand what this job is? And I said, I have no clue. And they started laughing and said, well, all we need you to do is sweep up hair around clients, make sure they get teas and coffees. When the hairdressers have done things like colouring, you clean all the sinks. When they've dyed people's hair, you clean all the tools and you just make sure everything looks clean and tidy and pristine and clean the mirrors. I said, I can do that. I can do that. And I also, I'm, I'm really polite as well. And they, they started laughing again I was quite a big chap back then, I was quite a big chap. And they said, you know what, when can you start? And I said, well, I can, I can start today if you want. I'm not doing anything. They went, seriously, I said, yeah, why not? So I did, they handed me the brush. And I remember them just stood there watching me. And I, I remember them me going in and saying hello to the hairdressers and I was introduced. And then as soon as I saw any hair fall, I was straight away over it. And the hairdressers were going, you'd have to do it every time piece of hair falls gone. I was like, oh, sorry, sorry. And then I would say, hello, mom, would you like a cup of tea or a coffee? Hello, sir, would you like tea or coffee? Made sure they were really cool. Um, after that day, yeah, they said, let's, let's do it. Come in, come in tomorrow. Came back in the following day, uh, made sure everything was really spotless and clean. But what I also did, I was watching the, the hairdressers dye people's hair and highlight people's hair, and they were leaving a really big mess. But I was also watching them go into the storeroom and I was watching them going through, trying to find the right colours. It was all higgledy peel, it wasn't any order. And in my head, I like things in order. So I actually went back there and just completely ordered everything, organised it, and then completely cleaned everything and made sure it was all laid out, all their tools. And I remember the shock on their face when they walked around and they were like, oh, thanks very much. And it kind of made their job a lot easier. Now, I stayed in there for a couple of months, actually. The, the owner said, look, why do you fancy doing hairdressing? I said, I don't know. He said, why don't you give it a go? And he got me a, a placement in the college, in Plymouth College of hairdressing. And I remember starting. Straight away, it scared the living daylights at me because it was assignments and it was reading and writing again. I knew I was not there yet. 
And I tried to hide it a bit, to be honest with you, I tried to mask it a bit. But what I, what I was good at was I, if you showed me something, I could visualise it and then I could do it straight away. But also in my mind, I would watch something and think to myself, how can I do that better? How can I make it better? Or how can I make it flow better? And one of the things they taught me was uh, effleurage and petrissage. That's head massage. Effleurage and petrissage, head massage. And I got quite good at it to the point where they asked me after a few weeks to be the demonstrator to other students. And I took it back to the salon and it, I was so good at it, the salon, as a sideline, uh, were purely taking bookings for head massages for just me, which was cool. I was earning extra money. I didn't want to be a hairdresser though. It wasn't for me. In here, something wasn't right. And I knew I had to get out of it. And I spoke to Simon and his lovely wife and they understood. And I said, Look, I'll work out, I'll work out the two weeks. They said, Are you sure, Carl? I was like, yeah, it's not for me, you know. I remember walking down towards my flat again and on the, just literally three or four doors down, there's another job in the window and it said, it was JJB Sports actually, and it was um, people wanted for working on the desk basically. So I thought, oh, do you know what, let's try this. Let's try retail. Let's go for retail. So I went in and I spoke to the young chap in there and he introduced me to the manager. I just told him what I've just been doing, what's, what's been going on. And I said once again, you know, can I, do you want to give us a try? You know, I've got no CV, got no experience. I'm a really quick learner. And I, I think I once again made him laugh a bit. And he said, can you come in next week for a trial? And I said, yeah, of course I can. Stayed with them for about three months, JJP. Uh, first month was amazing, got with the manager so well. And it was over Christmas as well, which was brilliant. Uh, we worked really, really hard. But then they got a new manager in, and this new manager came in with a very different ethos. He was quite rude to staff, quite rude to customers. And I've always been in that mind, but you know, be polite all the time, unless you really, really can't, which is very rare. So we kind of fell out. And unfortunately, it was time for me to leave. So I left. Uh, I left the uh, sports shop, and I decided I needed something very, very different. What am I going to do now? Now, each weekend, as I was telling you, I was going to and fro to Cornwall. I was loving it. Uh, I had a friend down there living in a place called High Harlan. He was already living in a caravan at a place called uh, St Merrin, and we surfed the local breaks, which was Harlan, Boobies, and Constantine, and. Obviously, go to Nuki sometimes or, or Watergate or what have you. And I remember going down one weekend and I had a bit of money in my pocket. And as we're driving through to go and see him at the campsite, because we're going to stay with him for the weekend, I drove past a building site and I thought, ah, this is it now. I want to be here. I don't want to go back to Plymouth. But I haven't got enough money. So I remember going that weekend, a great weekend, going back to Plymouth and thinking, I need to get as much money together as I possibly can because I want to be down there. Now I had a friend who was already working in one of the big nightclubs in Union Street. It was called Blondes Warehouse and at the back there was another kind of nightclub called the Studio Bar which was a big student bar. All the students went there and he said look we need people to stack the bars in the morning. We need people to stack the bars in the evening and there's some bar work. Do you fancy doing that? No experience, either. you get taught on the job. I said, that's perfect for me, got no experience. So I started doing that. Once again, this thing kicked into my head. As I was stacking the bars in the morning, it was taking too long. I was watching everyone do it and there was no system in place at all. It was, it was just freaking me out. So I started putting systems in place that helped us stack the bars quicker, easier, with the correct products, products that are being used all the time, I started seeing this in my head. And I changed the displays as well. I changed the displays according to what was selling and what wasn't selling. Bar manager was absolutely elated. And he kind of took me on and gave me more and more hours. And so eventually I became the bar manager for the student bar called Studio Bar, which was absolutely amazing because I didn't work weekends. For some reason, students only go to a nightclub in this nightclub weekdays I had the weekends off it was amazing but crumbs did I work did I work um, stacking all the bars in the morning going back to the setup early evening right the way through till crumbs three four o'clock but earned a lot of money earned a lot of money I had enough and I knew 
I had a goal. I needed to get down to St. Merrin. And I knew there was building down there. I thought, we'll just get on that building site. Unfortunately, when I went down there, that building had finished. But there was another building site there. Long story short, said it again. Um, I was able to get a labouring job on this building site. Um, went straight in. Told him my last experience, car key. Went through the stuff. Absolutely fine. They didn't just take me on as a labourer. I became a ground worker as well, which was quite cool, actually. That's laying all the footings, which is quite a decent amount of money. I paid my friend who was already living down there in a caravan some money and I stepped in the awning which was the tents on the on the side of his caravan. I had somewhere to live. I was paying money, a very small amount, I was able to save, earning a decent wage, I could feed myself and I could surf as much as I possibly wanted. Unfortunately that came to an end and then I thought to myself what am I doing now? Now my friend who was already living down there in the caravan he was working for a gentleman called Rick Stein in a place called the Seafood Restaurant in Padstow, which is not very far from St Mary. And I remember being in the caravan one night, worrying about what I was going to do, trying to find a job, what we're going to do now. Stuck down in Cornwall, which I loved, obviously. And it was about one o'clock in the morning, and I could hear his little moped coming up through the campsite. And he came in, he unzipped the orange. And he was effing and blinding and swearing. I said, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, oh, that's it. I'm not going back to that place. It's, it's too much. They're expecting me to do too much. They want me to do more and more hours. I'm not doing it. I've told them that's it. I've just walked out. And there was the opportunity. I remember saying to my friend, can I have your job? And he just looked at me and went, are you serious? It's a horrible job. I said, I don't care. If you don't want it, can I have your job? And are you going to be cool with that? And he went, of course you can. I remember I couldn't sleep. As soon as the sun appeared, that's it. I, I grabbed this bike, a mountain bike, my friend's mountain bike, not just anyone, sorry, that'd be just wrong. And I remember just pedaling straight away, all the way to Padstow. And I got there about half five. It was all closed up. I remember sat outside on the harbour just waiting for someone. And then here comes the first people, they were the cleaners, and they said, oh, wait, if you wait another half an hour, the chefs turn up at the back door. And I went to the back door, and here comes this gentleman, I didn't, I didn't know who he was at the time. And I said, good morning, sir, are you one of the chefs? He said, yes, I am, is there, is there, is there a problem? I said, no, 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 uh, my friend was your pot washer, and I told him the name of my friend, he said, oh yeah, he's, he left yesterday. I said, is there any way possible at all, I can, I can come in and do the dishes for you right now, and if I'm any good, could I have his job? And he just laughed. He just went, what? I said, I, honestly, if I'm no good, get rid of me. If I'm any good, keep me on. I, 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 I work really, really hard. I just need a chance, sir. And he said, do you know what? I've been called sir for a long time. In you come. Now that gentleman's name was Paul Ripley. He was the head chef at the time of the seafood restaurant. Crumbs, I stayed there for a while, nearly three years long time. Uh, I worked my way up through the kitchen and became a prep chef under Mr Ripley. I learned so much from him. What I learned from those chefs was time management. Timing, time management. It was amazing watching them, how precise they were, especially like the pastry chefs, how confident they were in their abilities. It was stressful. I mean the first few months being the pot washer was horrendous but once again I did that thing in my head. I looked at things and went, well, that's all in the wrong place. I made things easier for myself and my team around me and the chefs around me. I'd saved quite a bit of money and I actually thought that's what I was going to do. I was going to be a chef. But it's in here again. There's something in here. It's not what I want to do. That's not my passion. I love cooking. I love food, as you can see. But it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I had a bit of money and decided I was going to just go off traveling for a while. And that's what I did. Worked around, did a bit of travel, met some amazing people. Uh, most colorful people I've ever met in my life. Just their stories and their colorful lifestyles. It was just beautiful. And it, uh, different cultures as well. Come back, had a bit of money and decided I was going to center myself in Newquay, the hub the kind of surf capital in Cornwall was Newquay in the early 90s. That's where I wanted to be. 
So I started living in a backpack. I remember walking into Town Beach Backpackers, just above Town Beach, and saying, have you got any rooms available? And I had to share a room with four people. It was five pound a night. The gentleman, the, the manager was called Ian. I got on really well with him. And after the first two days, all I did was would get, I'd get up so early and just go to every single shop, pub, restaurant. It was winter again though, and obviously there was, there was nothing going at the minute. They were saying like, this is the wrong time of year looking for jobs, I was like, I will do anything, I don't mind. Um, and then when I went back to the, you know, after doing all the search, I would go back to the hostel, and I remember Ian would be really busy, you know, taking everyone's sheets off, cleaning all their sheets, cleaning the rooms, getting the kitchen done, ordering the food, and I would help him, I'd say, join a hand, I'm not doing anything, Ian. Absolutely. And after a week, he literally said to me, Carl, he said, look, you do so much for me here, I can't take rent off you anymore. He said, I'll tell you what, come with me. And he took me to the very top of the hostel and he gave me the he gave me the the, the top suite all to myself. And all I did was help clean the toilets, the showers, do the laundry, didn't pay any rent, and he even gave me some free food as well. It was absolutely amazing. Towards the summer, he decided he was gonna have a couple of weeks off. And he said, Carl, would you like to run this place for me? I said, yeah. And he said, look, it's not a great amount of money, but you get a percentage of the money coming in and just make sure everyone pays. I was elated. I was absolutely fantastic. I have, I'm a manager of a hostel now. You know, I can, if I need more money, I can, summertime's coming up, I can get a glass collecting job somewhere or whatever. Great job. What Probably one of the most exhausting jobs I've ever had. Not the trawler. Oh no, not working on the trawler, building sites, lugging stuff around. This was exhausting. People would turn up all hours, you know, people just arrived from Australia, Japan, um, Canada, New Zealand, ding, ding, knock, knock, can we come in? And you'd have to, met, I, personally me, I'd make sure they were, I'd take them into the kitchen, I'd make them a cup of coffee, make a cup of tea, are you okay? Let's find you a room, try and sneak up, get them into a room nice and quiet. And in the morning when they woke up, I'd make sure they were okay, say like, do you want me to show you around new key? And I would show, show them around. I was like a, a tour guide and I'd also show them around at night, making sure they have a really good time. And I was burning the candle at both ends. I was exhausted. I thought to myself, I need to get out of this, but I need work again. Now at the time, there were some, there, right just below the uh, backpackers, there was the aquarium. It's called the Sea Life Center. And often I'd gone in there just to look around, because I love that passion marine biology, you know, I quite knew quite a lot about it. And I used to listen to the talks down there as well. They had the person doing talks, shark talks, um, cephalopod talks, uh, the octopus obviously and stuff like that. And then um, I used to watch the feeds and I was fascinated. On the front door, it said display cleaners wanted. And I was like, what's that? So I went in and I said, what's, sorry, what's the display cleaner? She goes, oh, what it is, we need someone to come in first thing in the morning. They clean all the displays in the morning, all the glass and then they clean it last thing at night as well. But they still come back in the morning because of condensation. I was like, oh, wow, who do I speak to? I can do that. I got the job. I got the job and that's what I did for the first couple of days. I would go in, clean it, and I did a really good job apparently. And whilst I was in there, I started talking to the manager and had a little bit of a chat and a little bit of a laugh. And he mentioned that they had a, a, a little slot for a talks person, a talks person. Would I like to learn the talks? And I said, what do I do? And he said, there you go. And he gave me a script, the shark talk. And it said at the top, present this like a blue Peter presenter. And I was like, oh, okay. I could try. It was a really bad script. It wasn't a very good talk. So I asked if I could do my own talks about sharks. He said, well, what do you know about sharks? I said, I know loads. I'm fascinated with them. I stayed at the aquarium for nearly four years and I worked my way up through the aquarium. I eventually left the hostel. I got a flat on my own, a shared flat with some of my friends and I, I worked in the aquarium and I worked my way right the way up and I became the aquarist. They even sent me back to college and this time I stayed. But this time at college something happened. It was amazing for me. Um, I was in my 20s now nearly. Yeah, early 20s. and. Uh, you know, they picked up on something that was never picked up in any of my schools and it wasn't their fault because I was never there long enough. But I, I have Rivers dyslexia. So I have a form of dyslexia and it's, um, 
it's not rare, many people have it. But basically when I'm reading text, I don't read a lot of books because I struggle, but when I am reading text, I can read, but I don't see the text. The pattern I see, first of all, are all the white lines, all the white gaps in between each word line up and become rivers on the page. So I focus so much on what I'm saying and the words, trying to not focus on these rivers, that I literally forget what I've just read within a second. I, I have no contextual brain. I, I have no context of what I've just read. And here's one thing that was massive for me. I have no inner voice. What does that mean? I can't read in silence. If you ask me to read text in my head, I've got no inner voice. It's the strangest thing. I didn't realise it because I never really did any reading. So I struggled a bit, but I had support and I became the Aquarist. I absolutely loved it. I'm now in charge of the aquarium, all the fish husbandry. Anything wrong with a fish, I would deal with. The vet would come in, I would give the medication. The alkalinity levels, the salinity levels, I learned all this there. And I was in charge of all the talks. I rewrote all the talks. Absolutely loved doing the talks. You go in to the office, you press the little button to inform everyone there was a talk and you'd say, it would go bing bong. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There will be a shark talk starting in five minutes time at the top of the shark tank. I repeat, that's a shark talk starting in five minutes time at the top of the shark tank. Thank you. And off I'd run. All the people would come up, big group of people around the top, maybe a hundred people sometimes, and I'd feed the sharks and do my talk and it was brilliant. It then progressed a little bit further. I became the education officer. They made me, they said, Carl, we want you to become the education officer. We want to get schools involved. And any school that came down started specifically asking for me to do their talks. Now, I don't know why, but I, I was just able to converse with older people, teenage people, infants, toddlers. I was able to converse at all different levels and understand what do they want to hear, really? What? What kind of facts do they need and how do I talk to them and how do I use my, my body to talk to them as well, your body language. I really thought about it. It's that thing again. I was processing all this stuff, trying to make things better in my head. I actually started reading books and watching videos about psychology and how to communicate with people. I was fascinated with it. Anyway, here we go again, long story short. There was a young lady who kept bringing her nursery children down for my little guided tours and she owned a nursery chain called Happy Days Nurseries. She was called Sarah Carkeek. And she approached me one day and she went, Do you know what, you would be a great teacher. Have you ever thought about teaching? And then something in me, in me here, I thought, actually, I love it. I love learning things, trying to make things better for people and then teaching them how to do it. I actually do. And if I haven't any information, that would be great to try and Possible, but how do I do that? I remember saying to her, oh, you know what? I wouldn't be able to become a teacher. I, I left school with no GCSEs whatsoever. I, I wouldn't be able to do it. And then she just looked at me and said, well, how have you become the Aquarist, the person in charge of this business? Because they obviously trust you. And a little light bulb went off. I thought, oh yeah, look at where I've got to. What I didn't tell you as well, other jobs that I did in the aquarium, I was also Sammy the Seal, which is not brilliant. I wasn't going to bring it up. But that was dressing up as a nine foot seal, going around to camp, four campsites a night, four campsites a night, sorry, four campsites a night, dancing in this suit on the stage with the entertainment crew. It was horrendous. I think I lost about a stone in one summer season. It was the stinkiest thing I've ever done. But no, she really, a light bulb went off and I thought, yeah, why? Why couldn't I go on to something else? But I loved it there. I genuinely liked working there, but I knew maybe there is something else. After a long meeting with her, I remember going to have a coffee with her, and we had a big meeting. She's, I went up to one of the nurseries and I looked at the area and she explained how she wanted to change the way early years in nurseries is seen and the way it's supplied. And she said, I think you're the person to do that with your experience of outdoors and marine biology and using the beaches. And I thought, what a great idea. So here comes the next bit of my journey. That's exactly what I did. Um, I started working for Happy Days Nurseries. I started off as a nursery nurse, worked through my MDQ level one, two, and three, did my childcare diploma, 
did studies in child psychology, then looked at early years education as a whole. Really looked at the Norwegian kind of model, this outdoor education. I was like, wow, when I was back, like early 2000s, I changed the way we interacted with children in this particular nursery. Uh, we did, it was very different. We were taking the children to lots of outdoor areas, doing lots of outdoor learning in the environment. I, I was he helping the children build these beautiful relationships with the environment and the outdoors and where they lived. Carried on, a uh, good four years later, it got recognized. Um, I was taken up to London and I, I was awarded Nursery Personality of the Year and some accolades came with that as well and I was also recognized for the changes that I'd made in early years and became early years ambassador for the whole southwest which meant I started going to colleges schools and talking about early years as a career and how I got there and where you could go with it I loved it absolutely loved it but once again there was something in here I just knew there was something a little bit more and what I loved so much was watching how the children were learning in the outdoor environment around the coastal areas, like the beaches, um, the coastal the cliff areas, uh, in the woodlands around. I love watching that, how they interacted with it and built these relationships. I thought, that's what I need to do. I need to be confident now and have my own business. It was the biggest, bravest thing I've done. And I set up the kids department with O'Neill, Surf Academy on Watergate Bay. And I just literally took all my experience and went and produced this little program where people paid and schools paid to come with me. Some of it was part of their core curriculum. They'd be learning science, maths, literacy. Some of it was just pure fun. Surfing, bodyboarding, snurfling. Yeah, I made up all these new activities, rock pool rambles, rock pooling, foraging, cooking food in caves that we've just caught. It was, it was brilliant. I absolutely loved it. It's going really, really well. Things change. Businesses change. Uh, Watergate changed. And we lost the building where we were, unfortunately. But that's fine. I was approached by Lusty Glaze. And it was a beautiful little beach, private beach. And it had its own adventure centre where they had zip lines and they had uh, cliff climbing and abseiling and potholing and activities. And they said, come and, come and bring your business to us. So I did. I started working on their beach. Now, also on their beach, they had the National Lifeguard Training Centre. And I thought, I want a bit of that as well. And I said, put me through one of your lifeguard courses, will you? And they did. I became a fully qualified beach lifeguard. It's hard work, by the way. I was a lot fitter back then. Not like this now. I was a lot fitter back then. But um, it was great because I learned quite some high level kind of first aid. and learned a lot about kind of physiology and biology and about the human body and about myself and about how I could teach that to others and I started teaching then I actually became a trainer assessor so I was doing my stuff trainer assessor for the lifeguard courses and then I took on the cliff work I, I learned rope skills I became a single pitch award climber and climbing instructor and then I became an outdoor instructor all while I was there I wanted to be a part of everything and just feed all my experiences down to people so they could have the same great experiences. So, where did that go then? I was fine. I was absolutely fine. I was doing my thing. And then I got approached by the British Surfing Association, which is no longer with us anymore. Uh, it's the National English Surf Federation, no? but it was, the, it was the British Surfing Association. And they asked me to come on board and be a consultant. Use my experience to help teach surf schools how to teach surfing at better levels. We were like the Ofsted of surf schools. We'd go in and make sure surf schools were doing it proper. With a brilliant gentleman called Baz. He was absolutely super at Baz. And um, I then got asked to go around the whole of England and represent uh, the British Surfing Association. It was sponsored by Calypso Drinks. And we'd go into all these inner cities, deprived areas, and try and get kids in, 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 in really in, in, um, interested in surfing. And we did that because we had these special boards, these street surfing boards, and I'd teach them surfing on these special boards and these big arenas. And if they were really good, I'd approach the parents and say, look, we can, we'd like to pay for a three day holiday, come to Cornwall, we'll teach them how to surf. If they're really good, we'll keep training them, keep teaching them. They can even get to competitions, we're introducing a brand new sport to them. And it did, it worked. 
You know, we got two kids out of that that got into competition level. That was brilliant. From there, I then helped a surf school called the Animal Surf Academy. Um, really set a standard. They want to set a standard really high, so I went in as a consultant, took it over a little bit, and it was the first surf school, it's called a school, to go through Ofsted. So we were saying, if you're gonna be a surf school, do it properly. And we started setting the bar high. Other surf schools really had to follow, you know, how we taught, how we interacted. Now, there's a couple of slides with this video. The first slide, you're gonna see all those little jobs that I've been through, all those little journeys. The second slide, there's lots of little links that you could go into to see where else I've been. And one of the links right at the bottom, uh, one of the last things I did. So there I am doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I was approached by Cornwall College and Truro College to come in. And they said, could you do more talks on early years childcare? I did as a consultant. And then they put me through something called a 7307 back then. That was the post-16 certificate in education. And I started teaching MVQ level one, two, three, and childcare early years diploma for Cornwall and for Truro. I even started teaching first aid for Truro College at high level. Uh, spinal management techniques from all my experience from the lifeguarding courses, uh, pediatric first aid, 12 hour, four day first aid at work, one day emergency aid, defib training. It was great. I had all of it, my fingers and all these little pies. It was all the things I loved. But more importantly, it was keeping me in my love, the coast, the sea, the beach, that area, and working with young minds. So, where did it go from there? Well, I all of a sudden had a phone call from a gentleman called Jason Cater, who at the time was building this huge five-star resort in, uh, just outside of Weybridge, and building something called a Flow Rider, which was a, a surf machine. I was happy doing what I was doing, earning decent money, um, I was with my now wife and had my first son Oliver, uh, I'm still with, thankfully she stayed with me. And I had a phone call and this gentleman said, come up for a meeting, we would like to put something on the table. And I thought, well, I'll go and see what he's talking about. And I, before we even started the meeting, I remember saying to him, sir, I'm not after any, any work at all, but if I can consult for you and help for you, I don't mind. And his reply was, no, we want you. I said, well, what is it? He said, we want you to become the operations manager for this area and I said well what's the area he said, it's a flow rider restaurant retail you're the gentleman who's got the experience how do you know he said I've been following you I've been looking at all your links stuff that you've created stuff that you've done we just know that you're the, the gentleman and I literally said to him, I said I, I'm, I'm not honestly I like doing what I'm doing right now and with that he took a piece of paper out of his pocket he looked at me he wrote something on the piece of paper he folded it up sit it across the table and he said just look at that first of all and I opened it and it was an offer and it was a lot of money and I decided wow I know I've got my own business but it is stressful I've got a new little baby Oliver my wife this could be brilliant for us so I said yeah and I became the operations manager metallic resort and spa for the flow rider the loop restaurant and retail unit I had the experience this is the job now, it was all tailor made for me. My background in surfing, instruction, education, educating people, talking to them. The, the restaurant, understanding the restaurant, how restaurants work, how to interact with people once again, and the retail. I kind of had it all there. Now I stayed there for quite a while actually, for quite a while, really built it up. Um, and then I was offered to go around Europe with a mobile flow rider and sell flow riders. But then it was taking me away. Something still wasn't right. It, it just, it kind of just wasn't there again. I was losing the contact that I had with many people and many minds and that interaction, that, that bouncing off each other with ideas. So I left and created something called Fistral Rangers, which still goes on. I love my little Fistral Rangers. And it was basically my kids department. Loads of beautiful activities, foraging, cooking, learning about the marine body, learning about the environment, being safe in the ocean. People would pay to come on these little courses. There were three hour courses. You know, I'd run two or three a day uh, through the summer and then some through the winter. Schools would then come and visit me again. But it was all based this time in Newquay at Little Fistral and around Fistral and sometimes at Town Beach. And I got involved then with the Newquay Activity Centre, 
help them build up their co-steering kind of platforms. Uh, did some marketing for them as well, did some consulting. Did all their training, their first aid, their risk assessments. I'm back self-employed again. There I am. But it's what I want to do. And it happened again. I was approached by a head teacher of a small school that I love dearly. Trinance Learning Academy. Best school in the galaxy, by the way. Best team ever. So, she said to me, have you ever thought about being a teacher? And I said, I'm running a business. You know, I get many children. She went, yeah, but not all children can afford to come and do this. All children should be allowed to come and do this. Do not feel guilty. And she made me feel guilty really bad. So I said, do you know what? I'll come to your school and I'll have a meeting with you. And I did. And this is what I do now. Nine years I've been doing this. I wrote a program specifically for that school, first of all, called The Beach School, where I looked at the, the, the curriculum and met with the teachers and said, look, what parts of your curriculum could we still teach, but in a beach environment, in a cave, in a rock pool, around the coastline, geology, maths, science, literacy, year ones would come down, they meet a crazy pirate in a cave who sings songs and tells them beautiful stories about mermaid's tears of joy and then go looking for mermaid's tears. Literacy. Then they would look in the rock pools, habitat, science. They would collect data, maths, graphs. Went up to like year six. So now I'm supplying these educational programs for these schools called the Beach School. It wasn't just that school. It was a lot of schools in that trust. I then built up a reputation. I became Mr. FT, the beach school teacher. And I did some training. Started doing my teacher training. Um, it, was, it, it was amazing. Then I wanted to create more and more programs. And then I came up with something called the community classroom. I said, look, I would love children to realize that just their classroom is not just where they can learn. Actually, everywhere they live is where they could learn. And the teachers need to understand that as well. Their community is their classroom. And that gave birth to the community classroom, wherever the school was, whether it be near a moorland area, we would take children around the moorland areas and apply their curriculum outside in that environment. If you, even if it was a city area, we would look at the historic values of that city and go and look at it and make them explore, make them love and want, and want to be where they lived, part of their community. I then progressed it even further, came up with other programmes, one of them, the Learning Lake Project. I sourced eight big Canadian canoes, helmets, life jackets, oars, and from my, from my background in outdoor education and outdoor instruction, we did canoeing on lakes, using it to teach them maths, science, history, and of course, just fun. Kids in gigs, taking kids, rowing in the gigs, looking at the history of the gigs, the history of their community learning about the Hewer's heart and the mighty Hewer. So, you know, that's where I am now. I am now in a position where I, I've become my job. It's not a job, it's not a career. I am just Mr. FT and this is what I do. And lovely people like yourselves ask me to come and do talks. I now consult in regards to outdoor education and looking at environments around the schools, within the schools and how we can use them more and more and more. How we can entice the teachers and children to come out and really get involved in those areas. I even work with local forest school leaders. Um, I'm a big advocate of forest schools, but forest school is forest school. And I actually don't like, I must make this absolutely clear, I don't like the word outdoor education. Taking children outdoors just should be part and parcel of a normal school curriculum. It just be, should be just what we do. But that comes with experience and us training teachers to do this. So there I am. My job title is Mr. FT, the Beat School Teacher, Director of, Program Writer of Outdoor Educational Programs, and I love this title as well. I am the school's fascinator. I create things to get the kids fascinated so they can roll out the curriculum and the kids do it with passion and excitement. Listen, thanks very much. And what I've done now at the very end of my presentation, there's a little video and it kind of brings together everything I do. Thank you so much for asking me to do this talk and I hope to speak to you all soon. But please stay well, stay safe and have a great Christmas. Bye bye.